and killing it with lives today. I'm gonna flood you guys with live streams. Uh, this is totally unplanned, which is why I have these goofy looking uh, headphones I have on. Uh, these are my workout headphones because I'm not one of the people who likes things in my ears, so I have to have this over the ears. But today, very exciting. So we did our live stream earlier. If you guys weren't on here, an hour ago we did a live stream. And uh, a man that I admire and have been following for a long time, Omar Abdul Malik, happened to come on and comment. And we've been talking for forever about how we're going to get together, do an interview, and kind of bridge talking about diversity in healthcare and talking about PA and, and med school and pre-med and all the whole things. We've been talking about it for so long. And so finally, I was like, listen, let's just do it right now. Because if we don't do it right now, we're never going to do it. We're busy people. So we literally whipped this together in the last 30 minutes. I've never done this before. We're going to do a live interview right now guys so this might go horribly awful i might mess up some tech you guys know i'm not tech savvy or it might go great in which case if it does go great let me know you guys are liking this stuff and we can do more of this ask questions guys right he's volunteering his time he's on the east coast uh he's he's uh with his family right now he's taking time away from them to be here with you guys so if you guys have questions about pa versus med school we're going to talk diversity in medicine we're talking about so many great things um, so get excited. Everyone give him a warm welcome. Um, Omar Abdul Malik, we're gonna hit the intro and then we're gonna bring it right in. So let's go guys, let's go. But stop making excuses, stop whining, stop, right? Get at it. No excuses, just dominate. All right guys, can everybody see both of us? Can you, so, uh, Omar, can you speak? Let's see if we can. Yeah, yeah. So can I? Can I? See yes. Introduce yourself. Questions. Okay. All right. So and I will announce any questions that come from the box okay. here. Go ahead. All right. Omar Abdul Malik. I am a um, physician assistant. I've been a medically licensed physician assistant for 20, uh, 20 years, and I also hold a doctorate in health education. So I tell you a bit about my academic background. Um, I got a bachelor's of biology from the University of District of Columbia. All the way back in uh, 94. I'll save you the math. I'm, I'm 51. It's going to be 52. <laughs> uh, uh, I did not get into med school, but I got accepted to grad school. I went on to work for a biotech company. I'm still kind of sort of getting in, trying to go for a pre-med, but did not really feel that that was the track for me. I learned about this career called physician assistant. I did not know what that was until somebody told me. And I said, why would you go to college to become somebody's assistant? I thought it was ridiculous. But then on the front page, there was, on the front page of the Washington Post, there was an article about um, the physician assistant profession and how great it was. And I, I really felt that it, it, it fit my lifestyle what i wanted out of life well don't jump ahead and give them yeah. everything let's okay. let's right. talk about it right, right. so yes. everyone say right. welcome everyone say hello i saw an assalamu alaikum in the box yeah. okay so, so yeah. let's talk about it so uh <laughs> only i can see your comments so i'm going to be reading oh, off okay, comments okay. Okay. um yeah like i said we've never done this before so <laughs> yes this I'm is learning. It's entirely new here we're working on yeah. here <laughs> yeah. um so it's very very important so uh one of the things that I'm always trying to talk to you guys about is positivity and the possibility of what you can be if you strive to really, really push your potential. And so in our discussions, Omar and I, we've been talking about like his pathway to becoming a PA and the fact that he was a pre-med early on. So I guess the place to start is, is why were you pre-med to start? So what attracted you to pre-med? What made you think that that was the right path for you? Why were you thinking medical school when you first got started uh, with college? Okay. All right, so I had no clue of what I wanted to do. Um, coming, you know, probably within my high school, um, I went to an overcrowded uh, public high school where we had 50 kids in a class. I was, it was a struggling um, county. We were actually one of the, one of the bottom <laughs> 10 <laughs> in, in the state of Maryland. I was the only one in my group, my homeroom group that wanted to go to college. So I was like a big deal. I, I still really didn't know what I wanted to do. <laughs> and I I didn't know anything about the SATs or anything. So I was just kind of like all over the place. I heard lawyers made a lot of money. So I thought, well, maybe I'll do law school or something. Didn't know what that entailed. Um, my my brother and I actually were having some, some social issues in high school. So my parents worked really hard. and They learned about this thing called prep school. Um, we were pretty good wrestlers, so we got into um, 
into prep school, uh, St. Stephen's School for Boys. And it was a paradigm shift. And um, these kids were like, it's not a question of are you going to college? It's where are you going? So then I was like, whoa, these guys are like ballers academically. So um, I, I had to do a senior project to graduate. I had an uncle who happened to be a mortician. And he did, um, he did autopsies. So he invited me to come to New York to um, watch him do autopsies. And I had never seen anything like that. I don't know. You're, you're an old guy like me. So you probably remember this movie called um, Faces of Death. Yes, I do. Yeah, yeah. So in Faces of Death, for those of you, guys, those of you youngsters, Faces <laughs> it's an of Death. an old school reference. Yeah. I reference 90s yeah. movies. We were like, what? So Faces of Death yeah, is yeah. a little bit before a lot of yeah, these guys. Yeah. <laughs> so they did something called an autopsy where you basically skin a corpse and cut it all up and, and you know find out why the person died <laughs> i thought that was awesome um so i was like wow okay what do i have to do to do this um i thought you had to go to medical school to do that and i just i just didn't know any better i didn't know any other path i knew my mother was a nurse so i was like well i don't really want to be a nurse so medical school I had no clue of what that entailed and that's, I think that's, uh, um, Dr. Pons, I, I think that's the importance of what you're doing. We talked about that. Just having a mentor of saying, like, look, this is what it means to be a pre-med student. So I said, well, I guess I'll call myself a pre-med student and do whatever it takes to go to medical school, not knowing what classes I had to take. I didn't even know what an MCAT was. <laughs> so I was just kind of... Seriously, I mean, that's that's what I was well, doing. Well, how many of you guys, so let's talk about yeah. this, because yeah. I think you brought up some interesting yeah. points of coming from yeah. kind of a, a, a disadvantaged high school, got 50 students in the class where it is normal, right? It is abnormal to go to college. It's normal yeah. to expect you're not going to go to college. And then going and having a prep school experience where people are like, no, you have to go to college. That's that's the norm. Just yeah. that change, how did that affect your perspective, right? Because you didn't know about the SAT, you didn't know all these things. But one thing that we were talking about, right, is this perspective of people who... You feel like you can't do something because you're from a certain place, you're from a certain area, from a certain background. You only see what you see, right? So do you think that going to that prep school really changed the trajectory of your life because it opened your eyes to the fact that, you know what? what These guys are ballers, but what is separating me from them? Why can't I go to college? So how important yeah. was that? And what would you say to students who are out here, who are watching this, who are either in high schools or in colleges or community colleges in areas where they aren't expected to succeed, where the expectations are low, and trying to find their place to say, am I good enough? Am I an imposter? H how was that experience for you? And what would you say to them? Yeah, I, I'd say, guys, and, and if I may, especially to you, you young brothers, <laughs> you have to create your own peer group. Um, you know, you, so for instance, I didn't know really what the SAT was. So I just took, I don't know, we took the SAT, you go to a gym one week and you take it. Um, so nobody studied for it. When I went to uh, prep school, uh, this is a funny thing. So I think back then, um, 1600 was the highest you could get. I got a 670. And this kid, when I was in prep school, he said, um, well, that's pretty good. What part was that on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <see>? yeah. <laughs> I was like, I was like, no, that, that was the whole thing. Like, no, dude, seriously, like... Was that the math part or the verbal part? <laughs> what are you talking about? His name was Chung Oh. <laughs> for free. He says, it's like, dude, are, are you serious? I was like, yeah. That's my whole score. <laughs> 670. And, and wow. It's like, so he, he goes around telling everybody, dude, Omar got a 670. And they were like, oh, that's pretty good. What part was that on? It's like, <laughs> it's like so, so I, didn't, I didn't even, I was so clueless. I didn't even know to be embarrassed by my score. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. so, you're too, too uninformed yeah. to know you should be like, yeah, yeah 670 yeah 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 and, and and it was i was like well what does that mean is that good is that bad i didn't know i didn't know i didn't know yeah so um and this is this is the importance of your peer group and just like brothers when we push like you were saying you're a big guy so people expected you to be a good athlete I was a good athlete. So they're always like, hey, throw this ball or whatever. We're merciless to each other when it comes to sports. But if you just pass your classes, then you're doing 
Yeah, me too. Good, man. Pass. He passed. So I knew a lot of guys that were like that. But when I went to the prep school, it was like, no, I, I talked to kids. They're like, dude, dude, I took that test with a hangover. I got like a 1300. I don't care, man. It's kind of crappy, but I just want to go to Carnegie Mellon. So <laughs> yeah. I'll be happy. So these, it was a whole different level. It was a very elite yeah. level. Um, and these were, you know, the prep school where I went to, you know, we were in the interscholastic athletic. So, so uh, Sidwell friends, um, those, that's where uh, Chelsea Clinton and Barack Obama's daughters went. We would compete against them, the kids from Gonzaga. You know, what school had the highest SAT score? You know, so it was a whole different level. So I started really studying. Um, and I didn't want that that ridicule where, you know, when guys and brothers would be making fun of me if I if I was articulate or answered questions in yeah. class back in public school. You know, if you didn't know stuff in prep school. If you're if you had subpar scores, subpar grades, like dude, you're never gonna get in college. You're gonna have to go to a state school. <gasps> you know? yeah. So it was a whole different ball game. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so so Abby Shine commented said this is still a relevant uh, relevant issue in urban communities. Though sad. Yeah. So the question yeah. becomes right. You talk about forming this peer group, and I think something that you mentioned to kind of bring it together is. You were talking about how you had this environmental shift of what was expected of you and how it was difficult being that right? you were getting this pushback and you were getting teased yeah. for not knowing this stuff. A lot of students struggle with that in the sense that yeah. when people, when they feel like, you know what, I'm not capable, I'm not stepping up, I don't have the advantages these students have, they shrink. And it sounds yeah. like you said, no, I'm going to rise this occasion. Yeah. So yeah. how did you do that? And then the question kind of off of Abby's comment is, how can we make it so that other students of color can rise to the occasion? So what is the so solution in your mind about forming peer groups? How can students go about buffering themselves from feeling like an imposter, feeling like an outsider, feeling like they're not good enough? Yeah, at some point, guys, I, and I did, a, I did a video about this on my own channel. I, it, it's, it's a lonely existence in the beginning. I mean, and Andre, I, I don't know what your experience has been. That, that's... That's the fact of the matter. In in the in the beginning, you're gonna if you're articulate, and for those of you guys, you know who've been through this, know how the feeling is. You talk white, you act white. Oh, who you try to be? If you're a girl, and you're articulate. Oh, Miss Prissy, you're a wannabe. It's a lonely existence, and you have to see. That's why I, you know, when I'm in, I work in the hood. <laughs> I mean, the the um. Um, I'm here in Washington, D.C. I work in an inner city hospital. So I walk the streets in my, in my, um, my suit, and my, uh, my lab coat, my stethoscope, just letting young brothers see, see me. And like, oh, hey, what's up? What's up, doc? Yo, what's up, man? Y you have to seek out those role models if they're not there. And we've got social media there. So people like, like you, Dr. Ponset, and me, um, I would, I would kind of make, I'd get them from uh, television, like back in the day, uh, Dr. McCoy or, or Mr. Spock. You know, well, yeah. Just trying to, yeah. 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 Um, uh, Sidney Poitier uh, played a, a, a doctor and a couple, and a medical examiner in a couple of movies. So I liked the way he carried himself. He had this blazer and he's very articulate and he really do his stuff. So you just have to embrace that fear. People are going to ridicule you. Um, I, I went to counseling once, uh, a counselor, uh, when I was in public high school, the kids were making fun of me so much about the way I spoke yeah. and stuff. Um, you, you just, you gotta be brave and, you know, we got a bullying epidemic. I'm 51, man. People are bullying people for decades yeah. before this epidemic came. <laughs> in some cases, you have to learn to throw hands. Right. Now, for being now no one throws hands. People are too litigious. Right. But, right, yeah. right, right. <laughs> Back but, in our day, right? You had to throw yeah. some hands. Yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> but, but you, um, you just, you got to be brave, guys. And, and you have to see, you have to say, okay, where do I want to be? No, know this, know that time goes by extremely fast. So when you're in high school, 
it seems like that's forever. You're like, oh god, yeah, these kids are making fun of me, and the classes are hard. Ah. That goes by like that. Then you get into college. Yeah, you're a freshman all over again. And you're like, oh god, yeah, I'm a freshman all over again. The class is so hard. That time goes by like that. So any type of of hardship that you're going through goes by very quickly. So if you're if you're searching for people um, to be your peer group, if 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 I'm kind of answering this question in a roundabout way. Um, know that they're not always going to be there, but you got to kind of create your own standards. Um, Audrey, you and I talked about this. I, I, I got so I got four degrees. I got two bachelors, a master's, and a doctor. Two of those degrees are from HBCUs, and I will tell you, at the HBCUs, the harder my classes got. <laughs> I had you crack it up. I said the harder my classes got, the less brothers there were. Yeah. And some like histology at UDC, I was the only black guy. Biochemistry, I was the only black guy. Yeah. <laughs> Organic <laughs> chemistry, I was one of two black guys. This is at HBCUs yeah. and Howard. I went to Howard um, for, for one of my degrees, you know. And and I was a professor also. By the time I got through teaching, my fourth year of teaching, there were like two or three black guys in the PA. Program. Yeah. Um, so sometimes that peer group just isn't there, and and you have to be. I think there's a song that I stand alone. You know, you're gonna have to do that, and it takes extreme guts. And and, and I'll be very frank with you. Most people have convinced themselves that they can't do it, so they just they give up. They give up. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's so spot on. Is is is, and it's an important point for everybody. I think people think, oh, I need a community to succeed. And yes, you should seek out community, but recognize the top is lonely, right? For a reason, they say that, right? As you continue to ascend in your education, as you move through the ranks, whether it's even an undergrad, move to your higher division classes, you're going to look around, and you're going to see students who aren't your, necessarily, don't look the same as you. Maybe they don't talk the same as you. And what you have to get very comfortable doing is walking alone. And we were even talking earlier briefly about social media and, and what it is to start a YouTube channel and to be out here and trying to spread what is important to you and what is true to you and what is your message. And it's hard sometimes, right? Like I always tell you guys, I'm like, you guys don't want to hear what I have to say, really. <laughs> like It's hard to speak the truth sometimes and it's hard to speak your own truth. And what you guys have to recognize is that students, you're living your own life. You're doing your own thing. You have your own dreams. And if you're so concerned about other people and you need other people to pick you up, you're never going to make it because it is a lonely, lonely world out there. You can see both of us like to sing. I guess singing is important yeah. to being successful. You must break into song every so often just to keep your life moving. Um, but I, I, <laughs> I want to just take a second and break for a second here. Omar Bill Malik is doing a phenomenal job on here. This is a live interview, guys. Right now, no no pre pre preparation, no <laughs> questions talked about in advance. So I literally want everyone to take a second, comment in the box, let him know you appreciate him doing this and being here. Bring your questions to the box. I see all your questions. I'll be putting them up on the screen. Um, and I know I said this video is titled PA, and we are going to talk a lot about PA, but I think it's also important when you have two healthcare providers, two doctors of color on your screen to talk about that, right? I've, I've always said to you guys, I am a black male physician first and foremost, and it's important that we have these voices speaking to this population because we are an unacknowledged group, right? We They, they don't see us the same, and so I want to make sure that we're taking the time to address this while we have, right? What, what are the odds you see two doctors of color in one interview? It's crazy, <laughs> right? So it's very, very important that you guys... Understand, we're going to get to PA stuff, but this is also an important discussion because many of you guys, whether you want to do PA or you want to do your MD, it all doesn't matter if you don't have your mindset right, if you don't have that belief in yourself that wherever I came from, I can be more than that. Whatever I face, however lonely I feel, it's okay to be alone. We've both experienced being alone, as we're saying right here. Yeah. It is lonely. There are times yeah. you're like, man, I wish people would accept me, and you get it from both sides. You get it from, you know what I mean? You get it from the elitist you know, people who don't look like you, and you also get from people who look like you, which even, I felt like that for a while, that actually hurt me worse, because I'm like, we're the same, like, I'm about you, why aren't you about me, why do you gotta call me white, because I talk proper, why do you gotta make fun, like, 
Why is it bad for me to want more? And so this is an important issue. And everyone, I appreciate this comment in the box right now. Um, Ryan News says, thank you for sharing your story. Sally says, much respect. Sarah says, love this. Uh, Chester says, thank you so much. This is awesome. People caught the scene. Thank you guys. Chester Charles, I appreciate you guys putting that out there because this is hard to do. We are live action right now. No <laughs> script. Just two guys talking it out for you guys to help you guys. (laughs) We're literally putting this together (laughs) right now. Like I said, I have my running headphones on right now. So take a second, comment, like this video, put your questions there because we will get to all of this stuff. Um, But uh, thank you again. I want to say for me, thank you uh, for being here with us. Um, Mm -hmm. So we talk about, now let's get to it, right? So you've gone through this journey. You've gotten all these degrees. You were pre-med. Um, and, and you've gone now into PA, what was the moment that you made this shift? So saying, oh, you know, I'm pre-med, I'm going to do this, and, and, and making this shift to, I want to be a PA, what was that change like? Because as you mentioned, you went in undergrad, you're like, why would someone want to train to go to college to be someone's assistant? So you didn't really know what PA was, and right. many students, whether they're students of color or not, really don't understand what a PA is, yeah. And because they don't have a full understanding of it, may ignore it when it's an, a great, awesome career. So what was the moment that changed your mind and opened your eyes to what PA was and, and made you want to pursue it? Yeah, well, well it, was, it was a couple of things. One, I, I always felt intellectually inadequate. Um, and I, I think th- this is important that uh, my wife and I have got four children, so they're... 20, 18, 16, and 12. So we'll have three in college, God willing, by the end of this year. Oh, good luck <laughs> with that. crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and what I tell people is that not every college, not every learning environment is ideal for every person. I started my academic sojourn at Stony Brook University. It was this huge, huge, it was the size of, this, of a small city. It's part of the um, SUNY system. State University of New York. And you can get lost in the proverbial sauce. Everybody's a science. It's a high-tech, high-science school. Teachers don't care if you come to class or not. Um, And that was not a good environment for me. I just said that I was not self-disciplined enough to to survive in that environment. Um, When I came to D.C., and I went to the UDC, and went to a small, smaller college, it was important for me to have that nurturing. Um, and, and I started, I said, okay, this is how I can push myself with, with baby steps. Um, my last semester of, of school, I took 21 credits. And <laughs> the teachers didn't want to sign me up because it was all advanced sciences. And like, they're like, Mr. Malik, you, you can't do this. You're going to flunk everything. I was like, no, I can't. And I was working full time as a nursing assistant. I got a 3.96 GPA that semester. Keep in mind, I was going, yeah. <laughs> so I was, I was working as a, as a certified nursing assistant at night and then coming to class in the morning, <laughs> you know, um, and, and that's how hungry I was. Oh, and after I graduated, I took the Kaplan course and did pretty well on the MCATs. And I, I did well enough to where I was actually tutoring people on the uh, how to take the MCATs. Um, but I didn't get in. But I, I again, still kind of having this vague idea about what a PA was. And it happened that uh, this friend of my dad's was a PA. He let me shadow him one day. And I was like, because he kept saying, well, I do everything the doctor does. And I was like, well... What does that mean? And this is the importance of shadowing, guys. You have to shadow a PA and you have to shadow a doctor. Do as many as you can. Um, once I shadowed him, I was like, yo, this is awesome. Okay, I think this this is what, this is more kind of a fit for what I'd like to do. So I got in, long story short, I got into PA school. Um, and uh, I became a PA. Now, when I had the opportunity again to go to um, to medical school, I was just like, ah, I don't really want to do that. You know, I'm, I'm, I like what I'm doing now. And I decided not to go to medical school for this reason. I did my, um, my uh, 
rotation, my uh, trauma surgery rotation at the school, at this um, hospital called DC General. Now, for those of you guys that don't know, uh, Washington, DC had the highest murder rate per capita in, in, in the country. Um, and this was during the 90s. Brothers were coming and shot up literally every week. And at some point, I was like, I'm seeing the same guys that I saw out of my emergency medicine rotation. And I asked one guy, I said, what are you guys doing out there? He's like, yo, bang it, doc. There's a wall going on. I said, you guys don't own one brick of DC. What are you doing? So I said, well, what? What are the, are the doctors, the black, where are all the black positive doctors getting involved in the community? And nobody was really doing it because nobody wants to go out there and take a risk and shot and working with, with the thug life is, it's exhausting and can get you killed. I wanted to be that, that brother that was out in the community and knew people. And even now when I walk the streets, people know me. They're like, yo, what's up, doc? Yo, man. Hey, yo, I'm a holla at you. I see you a bit, man. Where you been at? It, it's kind of cool just being that role model. And, and that's this. I'm doing exactly what I always wanted to do, uh, giving back to my community. And, and I'm really here. I'm here. I live in the community. I work in the community. Um, so so that's that's really where I made the shift. And then I, I did the doctorate in health education because um, Andres, you and I were talking about this whole coronavirus thing there needs to be a really big push toward health literacy and uh, you know developing a scientifically scientifically literate community that that's my passion now yeah so i, I guess i hope i hope that answered your question uh oh disappeared i can hear you i can't hear you can you hear me now yeah, yeah. Sorry, I was going to say, one thing that you hit on that I think is also important for students is that a lot of people think that, oh, if I don't become a medical doctor, I can't serve my community. I yeah. can't be there doing those things. And yeah. you've done that as a PA. So yeah. kind of in your, in your opinion, PA versus MD in your experience, how have you managed to give back to the community and make that a priority and be able to live that as a physician assistant? And is that something that physician assistants are capable of doing? What should students think about as they're going into PA versus MD and the impact they're gonna be able to make both in a public health perspective, as you mentioned, being an educator, you get paid to come out and speak and, and talk about health topics and spreading awareness and, and bridging that education gap, but then also, um, also going back and being able to do things outside of clinical medicine and being a, a leader in healthcare and being a leader in your community how do you think uh, that career uh, choice has affected it? Yeah, so so being a PA, it, it's given me the, one of the differences, um, obviously, in the in the length of time of, of training. You have something called lateral mobility. So I've worked, I've been a, a clinical coordinator, a research coordinator, uh, adjunct faculty member, a researcher, a public speaker. So you could do a lot of stuff as a PA. You don't have the physician title. Um, with being a PA, um, I've used the medical knowledge that I have to start. I started a young boys science program. It's the uh, Boys International Science Club. And it's boys between the ages of 8 to 12. And I have like she parts. And, we, and, and I bring in stethoscopes. Everybody gets their own stethoscope. And we auscultate for... Uh, Auscultate, don't listen to me. Auscultate for heart sounds and auscultate for lung sounds. And I've got ophthalmoscopes and autoscopes. So this is something that, that I'm able to have the time to do even with my busy schedule. Um, I'm a, a distance runner. So I run through the hood. <laughs> and some of the nurses are like, you run in this neighborhood? I said, yeah, I'm not going to be scared of my people. <laughs> and people... And, and, you know, folks see me like, yo, hey, what's up, man? Are you getting it in? All right, man, yeah. I'll see you. And it's a good example, I think. And, and I, I think that that's something I'm able to do as a PA. There, I will say this. There is nothing that I've wanted to do in medicine that I have not been able to do because I'm a PA. Um, there's a PA who I just met a few months ago who opened up her own practice. She partnered up with a, with a doctor 
and I think she's like, she she started with um, there's like two PAs and two doctors, but they all put their money in, so they're equal partners. So you can do that. Yeah. Um, I I I would say, if and I, I did a video on this a couple of years ago, other than maybe the the prestige of of you know. If you say, well, you know, I'm a doctor, and people are like, oh, wow, you're a doctor. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, as you experienced, yeah, that's yeah. short lived because then people are yelling, who do you think you are? Yeah. Like, you're a medical doctor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Who are you? Are you not? Yeah. And I, I think that's one of those things that I think that's something to touch on is I think so many students feel like the prestige of medicine drives them to be and to pursue the MD. And they don't recognize that you you create your own prestige by being excellent in whatever field you choose. And yeah. people often look at like, oh, well, I'm not going to do medicine. I'm going to do PA. It's a uh. no, guys. We are all healthcare workers trying to work together as a team to help patients. And you make the impact that you set out to make, right? You are as respected, as proficient as you want to be. And I think it becomes talk about health education literacy. Is people understand PA is a phenomenal career. And I thought it was important also that we talk. And and if you guys don't know. When Dr. Omar Abdul Malik has his own YouTube channel, make sure you guys go and you subscribe to his channel and watch his videos. But what he's talking about here is very important because so many people choose a career based on what other people are going to think about them as opposed to picking a career that fits themselves and then stepping into that role and making it that life. And so for you guys, I, I think for me, the reason I wanted to be pre-med and become a doctor was because that's what I knew about healthcare. My dad was like, listen, don't be like me and struggle. Go get yourself a career, get educated, be a doctor. And it was like, be a doctor or you can live in the projects like I did. And I was like, I don't live in the projects. Let's go be a doctor. And so that's like all I knew. I didn't know that there were yeah. other careers in medicine. And it was funny, I was having this conversation the other day in, in the attending lounge, talking to other anesthesiologists who are attending, who are medical doctors. And we were having a discussion about how there are so many great what we would call mid-level provider uh, careers that people are unaware about. And like, man, I look at you know this profession, a PA or a CRNA or a nurse yeah. practitioner, and you look yeah. at these other careers, and these are phenomenal careers where people are actually, and it was funny, the reason I bring this up is because the conversation we were having was because, I guess, I don't know if this is too much spill or whatever, but essentially, there's a lot of politics in medicine. <laughs> and there's a limited amount of dollars, there's a lot of patients to help, and everyone feels like the dollars can be allocated differently, right? What's different, right? It's politics, everything, right? And so in the hospital, it's funny because our department is anesthesia. We're like, listen, we need these resources to be able to bring in more staff for these hours for coverage and whatever. And the person who's denying this is actually a nurse who is the administrator right. on top of our yes. department. It's like, oh, gosh, right? Yeah. But it, there, it, So people, I think, sometimes think that you can't be a healthcare leader if you're a mid-level provider. You absolutely can be. And it's a matter of you making that decision that you're going to be that leader. So I don't want you guys to think uh, that if you are a PA or you are anything, or either, even if you're a nurse, you there are tons of leadership opportunities. And it's important that we all are aware. I only knew about being a doctor. That's why I became a doctor. But there are plenty of other perfectly viable, perfectly wonderful, even better fits maybe for you than being a doctor. And you have to explore that and be open to that and say, hey, listen, you know what? I'm not sure what's out there, but let me let me go look and be open to as things hit you as opposed to because and I think I always tell people like one of my favorite things to do with students is to convince them not to go to medical school. Because if you find a student and you know that medical school is not right for them and you can convince them to follow a path they're actually going to be happy about, that's really rewarding. So I think that you guys should understand that, that there are plenty of other careers that have great opportunities have great aspects and allow you to do things and other than the title like he's like he said pas do exactly what mds do there's very little difference yeah. and so it's it's a great career yeah and I'll, I'll share this with you guys i i worked an extra shift this this week because a doctor couldn't make it <laughs> okay so so yeah. we exchange shifts with each other um now by law I, i'm constantly in touch with with a, a supervising position we have to have a supervising position by law and um you know I've, I've got a great supervising position there was a time like when i was younger that bothered me like i said i'm in my 50s now i, I got into this field i was 
think 31. Yeah, 31 when I became a PA. I'm 51 now. Soon to be 52, God want. 20 years, so, two decades of PA. Yeah, man. Yeah. Getting it done. Getting right. it done. So, so I am, my ego is like, I just want to live <laughs> long enough <laughs> to help watch my kids become independent. What's the Spoken like an old wise man. I just want my kids to do well. I just yeah, want to be yeah, happy yeah. in my day and watch my kids yeah, be well. Yeah, yeah, oh my gosh. That's yeah. what I'd be saying to me. I'm like, everything's all good. Yeah. If my kids are good, it's a good yeah, day. Yeah, that's what I tell my, right? like, I, you know, my wife and I, just, I, I, I don't think she'll mind this, but her 50th birthday was, was two days ago. No, one week ago. Yeah. Yeah, don't so, mess it up. You got to get it right because yeah, she won't right, forget right, right. that. <laughs> I'll run this right. back. Yeah. <laughs> but but um, late happy it, birthday it was, to her. Yeah, but it was, it was, we've been married 25 years, man. And that to me, that is, that's, that to me is the most important thing. I know yeah. doctors, this doctor had a horrible relationship. It's half his money. Yeah. Now he makes more than twice what I make. Half his money goes to his ex yeah. and the child support. Yeah. So, and he still got the student loans. Yeah. So, you know, when you're looking at the salaries, and he's a miserable guy. I hate working with the guy. I'm glad he's this particular person left. I'm, I'm claiming statute of limitations because this is <laughs> <laughs> the person's no longer with us. But I, I'm, I'm happy that I don't have to work with the person anymore. Yeah. Um, and, and that's really what you want to look at your life, guys, is that we're not here for a very long time. Our lives are, are linear, okay? So if you're a video game, like, I used to be a big video game freak. My 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 kids took over from me. But, you know, you got your little lifeline, like your Mario Brothers thing, and you you know the lifeline starts to go down. So when you get to be my age, the average life expectancy is what seventy eight point five or whatever. When you get to where I am, at you know, I I, I dare say where we, are. <laughs> but it's like you start to look at. Okay, how much time do I have left here? Yeah. And I don't want to waste it. And am I really happy? You know, can I look back at that and say, yeah, you know what? I made the right decisions. I'm telling you this from experience. Who you live with as your mate, that that is that that is a huge. That's probably the single most important experience. Jobs come and go. Careers come and go. I personally know doctors who just said, look, you know what? I decided to walk away from medicine. I don't, I don't good, good friend of my parents, very successful OBGYN practice that catered to like the, the established. Got sick of it. Got sick of the no. overhead. Got sick of like chasing after patients when the, when the payment structures, and this is another thing, guys, there's going to be a lot of changes depending on what administration is in charge. So, so you've got, reimbursement issues so doctors yeah. don't get reimbursed for services i mean you know yeah like the, like they used to so she just got and she walked away she started doing consulting and businesses and stuff like that you know yeah no i think it's a very good point is is chase the money but that money comes and goes jobs come and go is life so let's talk about that so you've been married for 25 years congratulations on that yeah. how have you balanced your career in in healthcare? and the family and how do you make those two things work because even you know as much as we try to control our healthcare hours yeah. as you had to pick up an extra shift last night like yeah. things happen things get busy how do you stay you know with your priorities and what's important to you and your value yeah. system and balance that lifestyle out well i i'm i'm very less fortunate um to be married to to um the type of woman that i'm married to she my wife is an awesome homemaker She's an incredible educator. So I, I, one of my values, it sounds old fashioned, but I didn't want my wife to have to work. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean, she doesn't have to grind. It's like, look, baby, if you don't work 40 hours a week and then pick up <laughs> some moonlighting hours at Walmart, cause you know, you can get, you know, head cashier, they got an opening right. and maybe we can pay the mortgage. Or the, I mean, that puts tremendous stress on right. a marriage. So I wanted to be, I wanted to have the type of marriage and the type of finances where my spouse didn't have to work to just to make ends work. So she right. doesn't have to. So her passion is like really working with our children. And I think 
we've got these four amazing kids. I'm in all of them now. I'm like, wow, that's so cool, man. They're all <laughs> like up to here on me. And I try to spend time with each one of them and, and it, um, to appreciate their individuality. And as they, as they trans, our older, older ones transition into young adulthood, kind of not helicopter over them, let them make their young adult mistakes, not fall down too hard, but like, okay, well, let's try this career path. Well, what do you think about that? What do you think about this? Um, and, and then I'm a community leader. Uh, people have made me. <laughs> I don't want to be, but I, I'm, I do a lot of community services. So I, I go to um, our local masjid in, um, that's a Muslim place of worship, give lectures. I teach classes. Um, I also do it at community rec centers. And, and just, it, it takes, I describe life like this. It's not a seesaw. Like you'll see this 180 degree balance. It's not where well, you got this fulcrum. It's not that. It's, it's, a, it's a mobile. So you got you got this thing here. Are <laughs> you going to build the mobile right here? Yeah. We are and, live and, action people. Look at this yeah. live action building yeah. mobile right there. And, and it's like, <laughs> okay, well, if I take time out with my wife and things, no. and then, okay, well, no, okay, this kid needs that. Oh, wait, oh. No. You know, and it's it's very, um, it, it takes, you're, you're in constant balance mode. So. Right. I, I would say number one, you have to be extremely self-disciplined. I'm not a very intelligent guy. Like on the bell curve, I'm probably right in the middle. And if there's any credence to these ridiculous eugenics guys with Negroes, <laughs> I might even be behind it though. So I, I compensate for that by discipline. Okay. I found with I had a um, one of my professors, Dr. Ella Pinion. Um, when we graduated from PA school, he said, read something every day, even if it's just a page. And I try to do that. It, we got, you know, I don't know, we're from the time when before Google, you could Google Siri. Yeah. What is such and such? You know, yeah. you actually had to look stuff up. You had to go to the library, find the journal, look in the card catalog, find the journal, yeah. <laughs> hope the journal was there. So, you know. Yeah. Read the latest information, and you don't have to be an expert, but get a general sense of this stuff. Um, and, and you can compensate for your lack of intelligent quotient. Yeah. Um, and I, I would say um, exercise. Exercise is huge. So again, being a distance runner, uh, my my one son, my 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 uh, six, soon to be sixteen year old, actually is taking a distance money. So we're we're going to do our um, our half marathon, rock and roll marathon together. Nice. 15.1 uh, <laughs> miles we've been training. Uh, uh, my oldest son likes to lift weights, so we do lift weights together. The youngest one likes to go swimming, which I hate doing. But <laughs> you do it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't even swim. I dog paddle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But my daughter, I haven't quite figured out what she likes to do, but she likes to just kind of chill and go yeah. to a movie. So. We're just the rest that, of you but, guys are active enough for her. She'll watch you guys. Yeah, yeah, just yeah, chill. <laughs> yeah. And then my wife and I try to do a, a walk. Oh, and then we all. My wife's a black belt. She got her black belt before me. Gotcha. So, so we all we take karate class at the community rec center. Not that we're gonna go out for UFC or MMA, but because it's a good family fitness activity. No. Um, and it just it just takes. I would tell you guys this, especially for those of you guys that are younger. Look, look at, and, and Dr. Pine said, you, you've talked about a lot about this, the importance of, of a schedule. If you look at your time from the time you wake up from the time you go to bed, there's a lot of empty space in there. And we got these cell phones now. My God, they're ubiquitous. Yep. And, and you know, you, by the time you get through Facebooking and FaceTiming and you've wasted, you've spent hours that you could have done in self-improvement, you know. So, so really work to have have an idea. I, I knew what type of man I wanted to be when I was a lot younger, like in my early 20s. Um, and my dad was a good role model. Um, he's still alive today, that guy, healthy. I, I, I knew 
that I wanted to be somewhat of a kind of a leader, not maybe on a national level, but at least a community level. I knew I wanted to be fit. Yeah, I'm a small guy, but I'm I I'm pretty strong for a skinny guy. I knew that I could make myself smarter than I actually thought that I was. Just the discipline of reading yeah. and not watching so much junk. Um, so I, I've reached. Are you, are you yeah. on TikTok? Are you on TikTok? No, I'm not on TikTok. No, I'm not no. on TikTok either because it's no. junk. So, <laughs> I had to throw that out there. So yeah, see, there's, I, a, there's always new stuff. There's always some new thing to distract you guys. And yeah. I think that was such an important point you meant there. Or you said there, it doesn't matter where you are in your natural brain proclivity to be smart, to be intelligent. You make yourself intelligent by feeding your brain. You mentioned read something every day. I am constantly, it, I challenge you guys, right? So I, I do events and I'm out at different places. If you see me, I challenge you. Ask me what two books I'm carrying because I always carry two books for me. I might be in the mood for one of them, but one of them I will want to read and I make yeah. sure that I read every single day. And that if you do that, you'll build this fund of knowledge that will make you rich in knowledge. And you'll be, all of a sudden you'll see like, wow, I know a lot of stuff. That's kind of cool. Like you will be that intelligent person. I'm going to disappear for, I'm going to show you something. Two seconds. Okay. <laughs> the second part of that is that for you guys, understanding that you can overcome your lack of intelligence by being consistent and putting that work in. So for you guys just okay. joining us, we are live Sorry. action. Two doctors here, Dr. Pines and Dr. Omar Abdul Malik. We got a PA, we got a physician, and we're talking about pa dumb, fish physician dumb, being black in healthcare. We're talking about things. If you have questions, put them in a box. I'm addressing some of you guys' questions as I ask uh, Omar these questions. I'm bringing you guys' questions in, so make sure you guys ask questions. If you guys are enjoying this, we are live action. We are scrapping this together. As Rana just said, like I love when healthcare professionals pull out pens and papers. We are. He pulled out that mobile in the moment. So again, kudos for having that. But if you guys are enjoying this, make sure you guys take a second, like the video, please, 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 please go subscribe Omar Abdul Malik's YouTube channel and make sure you guys let him know that you guys are happy to have him here because he's taking time. Like I said, he values his family. He's, he's in a room locked away from his family right now to be here with you guys. So I truly, truly, I appreciate it. And I want you guys to know, in case you just are getting here, we are live action. This is a live interview, impromptu. And a, like appreciate this for what it is and show your appreciation by liking the video and commenting and letting a Dr. Abdul Malik know that you appreciate him being here and sharing this with you guys. So he just went to go get another visual aid yeah. Yeah. at the moment. What we got? Yeah. All right. So this is, I'm talking about <laughs> reading and um, guys, I'm telling you this, this is what people have said to me, why they want to go to PA school instead of MD school. I said, well, you know, you don't have to study as long. So let me tell you something. I've been a PA for 20 years. The stuff that I learned 20 years ago has changed. I started in HIV medicine. This whole classes of medications, like protease inhibitors, non-nucleoside, reverse transcriptase inhibitors, non-nucleoside, this whole medications that aren't even used anymore. So, and, and then I, I learned DSM-3 when I was taking, um, doing my psychiatry. DSM-3? Now it's DSM -5. Yeah, man, that's how old I am, yeah. We had JMC six for Joint National Committee <laughs> on uh, for hypertensives. Oh, man. oh yeah. Man. yeah. So the stuff has changed. There's procedures that aren't done anymore. Yeah. Here's something. Now I've been working as a hospitalist for the past five years. This book, I don't know if you can see this. This is uh, oh, yeah. this is critical care and the ho and hospitalist medicine made ridiculously simple by uh, Michael Donahue and Mark, uh, Dr. Mark. Um, glad one look at this look you see that got tags in there now i've been actually one of your lectures dr prince um affected me because i'm a highlight freak <laughs> so, <laughs> so i said doc got it oh no yes well, you guys know <laughs> for you young people see yeah. he's senior enough to know how to study he's okay he's not studying for a test he's studying for his life he can yeah, use yeah, his yeah. highlighter you yeah. characters don't use your highlighter you're not allowed <laughs> So, I, do I, as we say, not as we do. Don't worry about what he's well, doing. Well, actually, no, I, I use less highlighters because of you. <laughs> but um, yeah, just to show you guys, you know, the studying doesn't stop. This is my typical patient. So here's a patient here. They got a BiPAP on. They're hooked up to mechanical ventilation. Uh, you know, the, the, you got all these acronyms here. SOFA, CHADS, PEEP, AKI. BNP. I got to know all that stuff. And that's my typical patient. And people are looking to me. They're like, okay, 
what do we do? No. You know, so so even though my knowledge base isn't as the breadth and the depth is not on par with a doctor, I have to know what the heck I'm doing. Because and I'll tell you guys this if um for those of you guys that are old enough to remember again, is um if you uh saw the show called ER. You remember ER, man? ER Little oh, Clooney, little old school yeah, Clooney. Man. George Clooney, yeah. That used to get my adrenaline pumping. And they'd bring the person in and they'd be like, okay, I need a BNP with a CB and a CBC with diff. Hey, okay, I need AP, I need a chest X-ray, uh, AP lat. All right, somebody get um, get uh, ortho down here. We got, and I was like, oh my God, how do they know all that stuff? Oh my God, how can... And I, I didn't think it'd be possible for me to ever even know that stuff. And now I'm the one doing it, you know? <laughs> and it's great. Yeah. It's like, okay, you do your ACLS protocol and... But you have to, guys, the discipline that it takes. Because I'll tell you, what happens is, I don't care if you're a nurse practitioner student, PA, MD, DO, you're going to get to a point where once you get out of school, the stuff starts to get routine. And other than getting your CMEs, those are your category, your category one continuing medical education <laughs> credits that you got to get every two years. You're going to be, the average person gets comfortable and then they get yeah. complacent and then they get lazy. Yep. And, and, and that's where I am. And I try to push myself not to be lazy. So I'm working on publications. One of my, um, what a, is a brother who, uh, graduated, uh, from the doctoral program with me. This guy's got over 200, uh, publications in peer reviewed wow. journals. And I'm like, God, wait a minute. <laughs> I felt so bad. <laughs> So I force myself to publish something, give a lecture somewhere, talk about something, turn in an abstract somewhere, just for the discipline of doing it. You know, I got a, I got my own library. This is, this is, I post some of my stuff to Instagram so you can see what I'm studying. What's your Instagram? Shout it out for everybody. Oh, so it's uh, O underscore Abdul Malik. Yeah, so um, O underscore a b is a boy d is a doctor u l m is medicine a l i k and i'll but, make sure i put uh, his instagram and a link to his youtube channel in the description so you yeah. guys can get it but make sure you guys go yeah. follow and support yeah. subscribe yeah but guys um, he's, he's, he's dropping gems on you guys right yeah. now i might have to do this weekly because yeah. he's yeah. kicking knowledge to you guys right yeah. now yeah. Yeah. uh so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah because because when you when you the, the kind of pressure that you have as a student where you're like, oh, I got an exam, two exams here that I got to write, that I got to give the presentation. Oh, my God. And I forgot there's that three-page paper in medical ethics. Ah, what did they give us? Medical yeah. ethics. You're going to have to take medical ethics. Um, that's, that's a different type of – and then your boards. Oh, my God. I don't care if you're doing the USMLE. got that weird USMLE board pass or fail thing. That's another <laughs> – yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, we hit on that, guys. You guys yeah, second yeah, video yeah. a couple weeks ago. Yeah, <laughs> but your your pants or your NCLEX. Now I study. Well, what's the because, pants? Let's talk about that. Yeah, so, yeah, so yeah. What's so, the pants? So the pants is that's the physician assistant national, um, PA uh, physician assistant national certification exam. Okay, well, um, let's take it an is, even further step back. Yeah. So let's talk about PA admissions briefly. Yeah, okay. Even though it's not right. the exciting stuff. This stuff is exciting, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but okay. I'm just getting, we're getting some questions about admissions, so I want to okay. make sure we cover that. So okay. in terms of making yourself competitive yeah. for PA school, mm -hmm. what are PA schools looking for? How is it different from medical school admissions? Um, what, are, like, the, like, what are the basic requirements, and then how is it different from medical yeah. school, and, and what are some things you can give for students to, to get themselves into PA school? Okay, all right. So, so first, I'll tell you my experience with this. Okay. Um, I, again, being a PA for 20 years, I was also a PA professor. I was an administrator, and I sat on the admissions committee for four years. So this is kind of what I've done. Um, so you're getting good advice from me. So you need a minimal of a 3.0 GPA. I'd say that not a 2.98, because I wrote a recommendation letter for a lady, a young lady who had a 2.98, and I said, listen, you got below the minimal standards. You, she presented very well. She was doing something in the healthcare, but you got 
you're not a strong applicant because of that. She said, well, it's almost a 3.0. I said, there's a bunch of people with higher GPAs than that. Right. She didn't get in. She could, she eventually got in, but not on her first try. So you need at least a 3.00 to be a competitive applicant. I would suggest that you have at least a 3.5. GW, George Washington University, where, where I live, um, they, they put their stuff on the internet. Well, our average student had a 3.5. Five two. <laughs> um, for most schools, you have to take the GRE. I th I I forgot what the uh, what the scale is. I think it's a six hundred. Yeah, it's, it's actually what's weird is the GRE actually has a very complex. Not a complex scale. It's like it's three digit number. It's just like now how how the MCAT is is yeah, it, ridiculously it's, complicated it's, for no reason. But the scale yeah. is three digits. Do well. Yeah. GRE. Yeah, I, I took the GREs back in ninety four. Yeah, something. I took the GREs forever ago as well. I did yeah, my yeah. masters. Yeah. And, uh, up. yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, so it, now it, it, one GPA, thing that gets people is is the um, direct patient contact hours. Now understand this, CASPA. This is what CASPA is. So CASPA is the centralized. That's the uh, central computer. I, I forgot what the acronym is, but that you got to go through CASPA to put your personal statement in, your letters of recommendation, um, your uh, your transcripts, and all that. So it's, it's the central uh, application process. Um, a lot of schools want you to have like 2,000 hours of direct patient contact hours. And now they've made it even more challenging. <laughs> I won't use the word difficult, but they want you to have it. They want you to have it in something that, that requires a degree or a certification. So something like an LPN or a medical assistant it's not where you have to actually have some type of training. You can't be. Yeah. I think. I think you were talking about being a candy striper. <laughs> yes, this is important. Yes, yeah, some people are shouting about yeah, it. Yeah. So this is very important. It's a big distinction that a lot of people don't recognize when they, because a lot of people who end up going PA, they because we don't hear about PAs. A yeah. lot of people find out about PA late, so they're often yeah. switching from pre med or pre dental or pre nursing into PA, and they don't understand. This is a big thing that trips people up for admissions is the clinical hour requirement is entirely different, it's much more extensive, and yeah. it requires a different type of clinical hour. You can't go candy stripe, and it yeah. ain't gonna cut it. So yeah. <laughs> you must get real clinical experience in a certified, or a, which ends up being a paid capacity. So mm -hmm. it's a different thing than the volunteering that you see in, in medicine, so go ahead, sorry. Yeah, yeah, so, so we're getting, a lot of people are, are often become nurses, um, one of my er, erstwhile, I, I think he threatened me because he, he's like, I'm unsubscribing from your channel. I was like, okay. Oh, yeah. he's, a, he's a nurse. Yeah. <laughs> Nursing is not a stepping stone to PA. I said, like, I'm just telling you what people are doing. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of people are becoming RNs mm -hmm. um, and then going on to PA school. Yeah, I subscribe to this guy, uh, Kanan Brown. He's, he's gone to PA school. Very good guy. He's uh, the ER form. So you can, you can, um, for something, I'm, I'm getting, I'm seeing a lot of, uh, people that are, um, ICU nurses, ER nurses, um, and, and that's, I think that's good in a way. Um, some of my misgivings about that would be, well, let, let me not digress. I, I digress a lot. So, yeah, so it has to be something, your direct patient contact hours should be something that requires that you did an official certified program in which you had to take a test, some kind of national test to get certified and then get licensed and that you truly come into contact with patients. So phlebotomy, you know, if you want to get a degree in biology and then do like a six week phlebotomy program, that's good. And I say that um, you need those direct patient contact hours because I, one of the courses I taught was physical diagnosis, and you had people who had never actually touched people before, right. you know, in and, and, and an examining way. So they're like, huh, huh. and then when you go into rotations and you got to interact with patients and you're, you're afraid to touch the person, right. you know, there's, there's, it's a very, it, I mean, you do a digital rectal exam or a, a pelvic exam. <laughs> You're zero to a thousand really quick yeah, yeah yeah i mean you know you can't be like oh, i just 
oh, I don't like blood. I just, oh, right. people. <laughs> so that's important. Well, and I yeah. think that's one of the things that students think they're going to go the PA route, and it's yeah. an easier route. And yeah. I often make the argument, I'm like, guys, it's accelerated training. Yeah. Yes, it's not the breath and the depth or whatever, but they expect you to be proficient yeah. to care for patients yeah. in a matter of as short as 15 weeks. Now, a lot of programs yeah. are 15 weeks, 15 months. The programs are now extending 18 months, 24 months, but it's a very condensed window. They don't have time to ramp you up. Yeah. You've got to come in ready, and they're polishing you. For yeah. that so it, you have to take a lot of this on yourself to get the experience yeah. to make yourself proficient to get there yeah and i'll tell you this guys we were just like dr pines is saying we, we were when i did my um rotations um at dc general we had a chief resident oh god jeez <laughs> for surgery <laughs> we were doing our our rotations with the third and fourth year medical students yeah. and we had to line up against the wall like you know like we were pledging or something all right, present your patient. All right, my patient, this is Mr. Jones, uh, third day. He's a uh, 21-year-old African-American male, uh, status post, multiple gunshot wound to the head and thorax. This is his second day on chest tube. His intake is this is IO, serial sanguinous fluid of 20. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you, you, you get to experience that. You're out there practicing in the hallway. People are like, why is this yeah. guy talking to himself out here in the white coat? Yeah. Trying to get his yeah. presentation together. Yeah, 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 but no, that's that's and we didn't. She's oh, you're just a PA student, you don't. Right. All right. No, man, they ex we you had to, you had to, you were expected to present, just like them. So it, it's and I'll be fr frank with you guys, a lot of people just couldn't handle it because it's this constant pressure. It's this constant right. pressure. So, so what did I do? Um, minimal three point. Zero zero. That that makes you a minimal applicant. Understand, there's many outstanding applicants. GREs. Some schools want you to take the MCATs, which I think is dumb. I mean, for for a PA school, and that's just my opinion. <laughs> um, your direct patient contact hours. Understand that even though if CASPA has something listed as what they consider acceptable. The, it is up to the school to accept that. That school, let's say school X, PA program X, may say, well, we don't accept certified nursing assistant um, at, at our program as direct patient contact hours. We'll accept nursing or LPN. Yeah, well, that's not fair. Well, that that's, that's their rule. You know, you, you're coming into their turf. Um, well, oh yeah, and and, and uh, your uh, letters of recommendation, shadowing hours, and I feel I feel really bad for you PA students, because there's not a lot of PAs in the country. I think that there's less than two hundred thousand, and the distribution is, is still, it's not a ideal distribution. So it's it's difficult, and you and I talked about this uh, before, Doctor. Uh, I said just the administration, administrative loops that you got to jump through. So I, I've, I've, if you're in the D.C. area, um, maybe you can give my my uh, um, my Instagram. Yeah. Um, we can arrange something where you can shadow me in, in a couple of clinics. Some doctors that have. So did you guys hear me. that? PA shadowing opportunities. Yeah, because yeah, it's it's you got to have some of the schools want you to have at least two recommendations from physician assistants, and I've written recommendations for patients. I mean, patient, for students on the CASPA. And and, and, please, and don't be chagrined if I deny, if, if I refuse your request to um, write a recommendation. If I don't think you're a strong applicant, I'm not really motivated to do it because it's time consuming. You got to go into the, they give us a special login number. You got to log in the CASPA. How long have you known this? person in what capacity <laughs> know them but, one day and they were terrible yeah, but uh yeah. I work with them and, yeah. I, <laughs> and then you got type of paragraph why do you think this person yeah you know, it's, it's it's really time consuming yeah. you know uh, and then you got to do your personal statement um i've done some videos on what to write about a lot of people have problems with writing well, i don't know what to say it's like <laughs> yeah but um uh, did I have you? Did you cover writing personal statements? Uh, yeah, we have some videos on that, and I think what we'll do because yeah. 
I think the application stuff, there's so much about this. Yeah. I think we should do a separate like session okay. on just that alone. Okay. Because okay. I think that, and if you guys, I know that you have videos on that on your channel. Yeah. So yeah. everyone, I'm going to put his Instagram and his YouTube in the description after this. Uh, we are live actions, so throwing together, so I don't have time to do that, but we'll put it in there afterwards. So you guys can go get some of those videos because he talks about that and breaks all this stuff down for you guys to know. Um, but one thing um, as part of this, there's some questions popping up that we can probably get to. So we'll, we'll do a whole session on application yeah. and yeah. also we'll direct to some of these videos on his channel because he covers it. So it's kind of, you guys know me, I hate double talking, right? When someone asks yeah. me a question, I'm like, I already covered that, go watch that video. Yeah, yeah. Why tell it again, right? So right. he's put this out there and, and so we don't have to rehash uh, that, but there's a couple questions. I'm going to start actually pulling them up on the screen here. Uh, May 7 asks, if I want to be an emergency room PA, Will I be able to manage more severe cases like someone having a heart attack or a gunshot wound, or do ERPAs only handle less severe emergencies? Oh, heck no, man. You're going to get bloody. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. You're going to get, yeah. No, you're going to be, if you just watch an episode of ER, that's you're going to be doing that. Because y your hospitals, as Dr. Ponce said, you talked about this, how the, the nurse administrator, the nurse with the master's degree in health administration is running the hospital. <laughs> so they've yeah. done the math and they said, okay, well, why are we going to pay a bunch of doctors 300000 a year with, you know, $100,000 of malpractice per doctor when we can hire a PA for one hundred thirty or one hundred fifty, you know, for $20,000 of malpractice and have a, um, an overseeing position. So... I mean, I I run codes, man. I, I that's what I do that routinely, but that's why I told you I, I study in fear because I gotta know I gotta know my stuff, man. Yeah. I, you can't wing a code, and, and you know, in terms of um, and I work in the inner city, so with inner city medicine, yeah, you're gonna get gunshot wounds coming in. I'm not doing ER. I'm doing hospitalists now, but we got the the major trauma hospital. You take care of them after they initially come yeah, in, so you exactly. still see them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so you're gonna you're gonna be it's it's just too much for a doctor to handle. In fact, I will tell you a quick story. When um, DC General Hospital, which was uh, that was that was like almost a stereotypical struggling inner city hospital with with. You know, crack addicts, gunch, you know, homeboys doing their banging thing, stabbing victims. I mean, all sorts of folks coming in. So as a student, we were so overrun. We had GW, George Washington University, Georgetown University, Howard University. I want to say St. George's Medical School, a couple of other schools. Um, everybody was, was in there. And it was still not enough because it was so much violence wow. in that area. So you, as a student, you'd be there like, you know, the, the resident would be like, okay, I got this patient right here. You take that patient there. Come <laughs> on. Let's see what you know. So I'd be like, ah. But I, and that's why I learned the importance of algorithms. I was like, okay, all right, boom, here we go. Give me a CBC with diff, you know, VMP, you know, uh, get radiology in here. I need a chest x-ray. So as a student, I'm like, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. So definitely as a PA, you're going to be in there and it seems overwhelming at first, but you're going to get really good at it if you're motivated to do so. So yeah, yeah. PAs handle some really tough cases. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So again, yeah. for people who are just jumping on, appreciate you guys all hopping on here with us. We are live, guys. Dr. Pine said here, Dr. Omar Abdul Malik, you have a PA, you have a physician in front of you, and we're talking about PA, talking about being a student of color, going through the process, a man of color in healthcare. If you have questions, please put them in the box because I will pull them up. Uh, the next question I see up here is, are there uh, PAs in oncology? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, I I interviewed with a pediatric oncologist many years ago. So so I'll I'll just tell you guys what whatever physicians do, physician assistants can function in that capacity as PAs. So for instance, pediatric neurosurgery. So a lot of people don't know that. I think everybody knows who Dr. Ben Carson is, um, Johns Hopkins University. 
I think he's. We should actually run a poll because I bet you, which is sad, but I bet you many students don't know who Ben Carson is, or they only know who he is from the political side of it, and not from the groundbreaking person he he was and is in in, in healthcare. So if you guys have not read a a great book, is actually in. I don't know if you call it a biography or an autobiography, whatever you want to call it, but it's the Ben Carson. It's his book. If you've not read it, I'm, I'm blanking on the title of it right now. Gifted, Gifted Hands. Hands. There we go. Yeah. Uh, if you have not read that, it's a great read just for some perspective of what people have gone through before you and what your journey might be like. Great read. Sorry, go ahead. Continue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He struggled with general chemistry, by the way. So I didn't feel so bad. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, what was I saying? Um, yeah, do- so Dr. Ben Carson, um, he was a pediatric neurosurgeon. Uh, head of pediatric neurosurgery at the age of 35 at Johns Hopkins University. He had a physician assistant working with him for, for like 20 years. No, nobody knew. Um, so whatever, what, wherever you'll see a doctor, like you probably have, um, Dr. Punset, you're probably going to have PAs, you know, um, and as you work longer, you'll run into some PAs. Um, Emory has a... Uh, has an anesthesiology physician assistant yeah. like fellowship. Yeah. Um, yeah. So 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 yeah. Oncology. Yes. Yes. The oncology. And same thing for psychiatry. I'll say spare us. Yeah. It's the same thing. So there's the same specialties you want to do. And I'll even second this. We have uh, at UCSD we have a PA who assists with cardiac surgery. So we have a cardiac surgery PA who assists with these heart surgeries. So there are tons. <laughs> of opportunities for PAs to do whatever you want to do. But again, it comes back to what you were talking about, which is you must be prepared for the opportunity. You must put the work in. You must be knowledgeable. You must be skilled because it's almost like being black in healthcare. People look at you a certain way, and so you have to overcome their initial perception of what that is. And so, like, as 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 I'm just not thinking about that, a branch point here... So you are a black male, you are a Muslim, working in healthcare. Have you experienced kind of, not necessarily stigma, uh, yeah, I guess stigma would be the word. Have you experienced issues with that? How have you dealt with that? How do you deal with that? How, how has your experience been as a healthcare provider now at this level? Yeah, I, I'll tell you, I, I, I wish I could have a sad story about how somebody was like, I ain't saying that, never a Muslim terrorist guy. <laughs> but it's, I, it's, it's not happened. I mean, I had, I've had two people in my 20 years not want to see me because I was just the PA. But one guy was like clearly mental. I mean, he had no. profound mental health problems. <laughs> um, <laughs> another was was a lady who who she she was a family member of, of one of the patients <laughs> and, and it's funny because i when i saw how she was i didn't want to see her either that's normally how it goes i'm always like the people <laughs> yeah, who reject yeah, me yeah. i'm like yeah. yeah we probably wouldn't get along you're probably right, you right, right, right. <laughs> but i i've never you know i got my kufi and my beard and i i've had I've gone in to see patients i mean I've, some good old boys from west virginia got their caps and they're like Hello, sir. I'm Omar. I'm a physician assistant. I'm here to render your care. I'm part of the medical team. Oh, Omar, really? Well, okay. One guy is surprised. Oh, salam alaikum. <laughs> you know. He hit you with it. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I've been. I, I, and I don't know why that is. I like to think that one of the things I've done, I, I'm very image conscious. Well, I was going to say that's and, the, the key there. If you yeah. haven't experienced it, it's because you carry yourself a certain way. And, yeah, and you, yeah. Go ahead. You're image conscious. And, and I would it. tell students this. I, it, just, it, just, oh, it used to irk me so bad when they would be like, well, are they going to respect you? I said, listen, you you present yourself in a respectful respectful manner. Then you don't worry about are they going to, you know, how people are going to treat you. You, you kind of, you know, I've had some people disrespect but they've disrespected other people too they're just jerks so they, um i've i i don't think i've ever been rejected based on my religion or my race possibly my gender when it comes to things like OBGYN, which i'm i'm i totally understand 
it's, you know, it's yeah. like some women just don't want men down there. Um, as I've gotten older, I've got what you going to call a few silver yeah. <laughs> silver hairs here. Yeah, so, that's why I had to so, shave today. The beard yeah, was getting yeah. a little too silver. I was like, yeah, no, yeah, that's going from silver, sexy silver, right. to <laughs> old gray. It's, it's it's like, oh, no, 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 no. Let, me, let me go ahead and shave that. I don't want to be old. I want to be sexy silver, not old yeah. gray. Well, yeah. So I asked you, like, so when are you going to go to medical school and become a real doctor? <laughs> I, I, I haven't had that question in years. Yeah. Um, and I, I think I think the public's getting more familiar with what physician assistants are. And then as a as a black man, if I if I came in, and this is one of the reasons why I started my channel. Um, no disrespect for brothers who present themselves like this. But if I came in like, yo, yo, what's up, y'all, yo, this is your boy, oh, my, oh, I'm about to kick it live straight up in D.C., D.C., Chapter City, so forth, but nah, man, you feel me, you got yes. that mad knowledge. Then I'm going to sound like a buffoon, you know, and, and maybe I'm brilliant, Yeah. but, you know, it's, this is medicine, yeah. and you have to look, you have to be able to let people know that you're intelligent, not that you're haughty. But that you're a knowledgeable person, right. that you're a professional. They want to see a professional in front of them. Now, there's a move for, for doctors. I don't know if you've seen this in your hospital. They stop wearing the, the lab coat and the tie. I still wear my tie and my lab coat. I get a nice, clean, white lab coat. got my stethoscope. Um, I'm, I'm polite and courteous. I, call, I don't call people. I got a pet peeve with calling patients honey and sweetie and dear Hey, honey. Hey, everybody's Mister or Mrs. Um, and I and I make myself available to the patients. Yeah. And I know my my own experience with with PAs as a patient myself. Um, I I will, if I could see the PA today instead of seeing the doctor three weeks from now, <laughs> I'll well, I'd rather see the PA. Right. Yeah. No, and um, I think something you said there is really important yeah. in the sense that you yeah. haven't experienced lots of pushback about your race. Yeah. And I yeah. also can say the same. I've had some bad experiences, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, yeah. that's a bad experience. But I treat skinheads all regularly because I'm in San Diego. Yeah. Like, regularly, there's, there's situations that could be a problem. But like yeah. you said, I think this is a very important lesson for students because I get pushback. Right, like when you when you are truthful, when you are real, people don't like to be held accountable. Right. And right. I get pushback from a lot of people because I'll go out and I'll do a live event and I'll do different things and I'll interact with students, and I try to explain to students, your first impression is ninety percent of the ball game. Yeah. And if you're dressed unprofessionally, if you're unkempt, if <laughs> your hair is like ridiculous, like I know you yeah. might express yourself, right. but within the confines of what is considered professional, the way you talk. Your, the, the preparation you've done to be prepared for that situation, all these things factor into how people perceive you. Yeah. And for me, I think a lot of people confuse two situations. And I'll just tell quickly as I comment this interview here, just for a second, I had an encounter at uh, San Francisco, USF, with some UCSF medical students like a couple weeks back. Because when I go out and I speak, I wear shirts and I wear jeans and it's very casual. It's different than my clinical life. And so sometimes people confuse how casual I am with not recognizing that, no, 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 I am a physician, I am a professional, right. and I am someone to, who knows what I'm talking about. And people get too casual with me, and right. I have to say, wait a minute, like, yeah. this is what's going on. And so yeah. the, the other part of that is that sometimes people feel like, and this is what happened in the situation, is people felt that I was talking down to someone because I was correcting them. Yeah. And I said, no, I'm not talking down to them. I'm trying to bring them up to yeah. where they need to yes. be to yes. be respected as a professional. Yes. And yes. this is something that I think that we struggle with in minority communities, but as a community, yeah. as a world as a whole, I'm just talking about TikTok. It's like, we've got to learn. We've got to learn, guys. You have to have substance to you that you are always being evaluated. And are you posing or are you actually rising to the occasion? And I guess my question to you would be, what would be your five cents for students in terms of being a, a professional, being a healthcare professional, being a pre-healthcare professional? What are some things that, like for students who come and ask you about shadowing opportunities or, or like what are things that you see in a student you're like, man, I wish you would have come to me this way or, or what are some professional points you can bring to students about carrying yourself the right yeah, way? Yeah, I, I would say this, guys. You know, I, I talked about earlier in, in our discussion about, you know, 
for brothers, it, it's a lonely existence. But if you're a healthcare professional student, it's a lonely existence. Because when you go to college, your friends that are fine arts majors or they're general studies majors, meaning that they haven't really committed to anything, they're, they're pledging or they're partying or something. They're like, I don't know, my boyfriend broke up. I, just, I said, what are you doing here? This is like a four-year camp for, for young adults, man. And you're, you're a nursing student or a PA student or a pre-med student. It, it's you have to be so mature so you can't I used to dress in khakis if you thought I was crazy I had a blue iron Oxford shirt <laughs> penny loafer shoes and khaki pants on a college campus but but I, I thought it was important I knew how I wanted to be treated by people I wanted to be treated with respect I knew that there were enough black guys doing a black thing and I didn't want to be I didn't want to be perceived as less intelligent. It ticked me off. So if you, if, if, if students come to me and I got a young lady coming, um, she was well endowed and she was kind of like showing. Bursting <laughs> out of her top. Did. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. And I'm like, I'm like, okay. So you, you, I can't take you with me in a car <laughs> to a doctor's office alone. <laughs> so, somebody who sees, like, girl, I know your man. I saw him with some young girl. <laughs> you know, and, and you, you, you always want to be thinking, as a healthcare professional student, you're you're here. Not that you're above everybody, but you have to set a certain social standard. You know, this thing. I I don't like this. This style with the ripped up jeans and it's like oh ripped up on half the yes. half the behind and then wait, let me tell you yeah. a ripped jeans story real quick because this actually just <laughs> happened. I had a student come shout at me, so I'm trying to get students in the shadow. It's very difficult because of hospital policies, so oh. I'm very kind of selective. And I had a student who was like, "Listen, I'm going to be in your area. I'm interviewing at UCSD. I'd love to come shout at you. Okay, fine, come shout at me." And it was the day after their interview, so maybe they were just kind of feeling like they wanted to relax, but they showed up to the hospital, and we had morning conference, so it's all of these professional anesthesiologists, it's CRNAs, it's like a a professional teaching session. And the student comes in, I didn't get to see them, like, oh yeah, meet me at the door. I open the door, as they come in, oh man, they had the turbo tight jeans that were like, it's this guy, but his jeans were so tight. And you guys know what I'm talking about, where the jeans are so tight, they can't possibly come to your waist. So your yeah. butt is half out He's from the behind. start, yeah. and yeah. then and then the kicker, I, I could like I could see, I was like, well, these jeans are very very tight. And then as he turned, the jeans have all these rips in the back, including I'm oh. like looking at his man high thigh, and I'm like, I don't want to see your oh, man high thigh. Nice. And I'm like, this is a professional setting. I'm like, how embarrassing is this for me? It starts the day off on a whole wrong oh, tone, God. right? It's like it's like okay, I was gonna come here, we're gonna have a nice conversation, but now I'm like, man, when can you, I might kick this guy out before we even put him in scrubs? Yeah. So recognize, guys, like yeah. <laughs> it matters. I can't yeah. take you in front of patients like this. I can't yeah. take you from my professional colleagues like this. This is their impression of you, and it was funny because people don't understand the power of this. <clears throat> this kid yeah. was super bright. He's interviewed at UCC, whatever, but. The director, the, our program, <laughs> our head of our department <laughs> is at this morning conference. And he is a very, he's a world-renowned neuroanesthesiologist. Oh, my gosh. World-renowned, <laughs> famous. And it's crazy to say this, but he's an anesthesiologist who actually does book signing tours where people show wow. up and they're like raving fans, whatever. He's this kind of guy, but he's very, very professional. He's hyper-intelligent. And so when he saw this, of course, he doesn't hold his tongue. He's like, who is this? So in the middle of education, who is this? And then it becomes an inquisition. It's like, well, young man, you're wearing this. Well, I'm like, oh my gosh, no, he's not coming on the jeans. <laughs> and then the session. And so it set the whole day off to a wrong turn. And yeah. the student was clearly embarrassed and hadn't thought about it. But you guys must recognize what you are putting out. People are going to judge you on your appearance. So make sure that you guys are being professional. If you're entering a professional setting, or if you want to be treated like a professional, dress like a professional. Yeah. Carry yourself like a professional. And if I may, I have to say this because... When when you're talking, when you come into like people are going to be coming to you and I for recommendations. Right. I take my word very very seriously. I take my reputation extremely seriously. So if I give my word 
and I say, hey, this person is okay with me. You should give them a chance. And, and that young person goes in and just acts a darn fool or they've got a funky attitude or they're dressed like they should, as I say, uh, interviewing for a, a job at Hoover's Bar and Grill. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, we should have that place in D.C. <laughs> but uh, it, it's, you know, it, it's just not. Now that reflects back on me because then the doctor and doctor, like I said, um, for those of you all that need shadowing hours, and you can, you can follow me because some doctors have agreed to let me bring students into their, their, um, their practices because they trust me, <laughs> you know. So it, it's very important. And, and uh, on that note also, since we have a virtual community now, the, the lady, oh, my God, oh, guys. Yeah. People are just posting anything on the internet. Yes. You, you're posting pictures. You're like, brothers, it's great that you got 10 pack abs, but you're doing the thing with yourselves of the thug bikini and, like, yeah, look at me. I'm telling you, schools look at that stuff. You Employers look at this. How many people have been fired? Uh, what was that thing that uh, Charlottesville March? They went yeah. back and found the white guys. They're like, yeah. Yeah, they're like, oh, they found this guy and that guy. Well, these guys have been let go from their jobs. So yeah. employers are using social media as another means of, of <laughs> weeding out applicants and firing people from jobs. Yeah. So you have to be, I don't put anything on social media that I don't want people to know about. It's like, exactly. you're not going to see my body parts. Or the anything. internet it's is like, forever. And uh, yeah. it's so funny. I always like poo-poo TikTok. And I had it reaffirmed that TikTok is terrible this week. It's actually, what, what week is it? Friday? Earlier this week. So if you guys didn't see, I did a video earlier this week talking about how Stanford now is doing, um, they got $90 million to provide more tuition oh, yeah. uh, reimbursement for students. But as part of that, when I, when I heard that announcement, they were reimbursed, like they were giving all this tuition to people who needed it. I sent a text message to one of the deans at Stanford and I was like, hey, like, where's my, uh, can I get a retroactively uh, take advantage of this program? As a joke. And then we were like texting back and forth. And like, yeah, so what's going on? Like, you guys are starting to make your final list. Like, you know, you're getting down the wire here. What's going on? And like, oh, yeah, you know, like, things are great. And I was asking, like, you know, are there any great diversity candidates? Like, what's going on? Like, I'm always here to mentor, et cetera. And it was hilarious because they're like, you know what, it's really unfortunate in the social media era, like, like we appreciate that you're on social media, you're doing your thing, but it's very dangerous out here. And like, you need to let your students know about this. And they actually sent me a photo and, and they texted me a photo. Maybe I'll upload it to social media. I probably won't do that. But this, there's, I guess I'm not on TikTok, but maybe you guys can inform me. There's a TikTok challenge going around apparently. Like, it's like a Drake switch challenge or something. I'm, right. I'm not well versed. I don't know. Oh, they do this. But thing apparently, or like that. I don't but apparently, know. it's like a challenge where, like, you're in the video and then, uh, like, you yell switch or something like that, and then you, there's like a time lapse and then the, the picture is switched. Oh. Okay. And so the okay. image they sent, I don't know, the image they sent me, uh, the little GIF or whatever, was a guy and his girlfriend in a bathroom, and he's wearing like normal man clothes and she's wearing like little skimpy woman's clothes. And then she's like dancing and then like the song's going and then all of a sudden like there was like a switch and then now he is wearing ladies underwear, et cetera, et cetera. And she's wearing the thing and the dean was like, yeah, this is one of the candidates we were seriously considering. Oh my gosh. And we did a, a, an easy public search of their social media and this is what we found and now we're having to take this into consideration. And what was really bad about this, the reason it came up was because I was asking about are there any diversity candidates who would be great. So this is a student of color who now is having their opportunity uh, ripped back from them because they couldn't keep their darn pants on on TikTok. And so it's all fun and games until it's not fun and games yeah. until it's your yeah. career. So I always encourage yeah. you guys, like, be very, very mindful yeah. of the comments yeah. you make, of yeah. the things you post, because right. it all will come back to you, yeah. especially as you move higher in the ranks. Because when yeah, you're starting out, like, no one really cares about anything. But as you start to become a leader and a person that people look to, you are under a microscope of scrutiny and you don't want old stuff that you said just in jest, not thinking in a minute, to come back. Or a post that's just ridiculousness. Yeah. I don't know. There were two two medical students last year of their last, like their last year, the last semester of medical school. They took pictures with, with their patients who had just expired. They got yeah. the patient there. They're like, yeah. 
they got kicked out of school. Yeah. Think about that. Oh my God. You, you, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm very careful about what I say politically. People ask, what do you think about this person? I said, well, you know, we have a difference of opinion. I don't use profanity. <laughs> I don't exactly. use epithets. I, I, you know, I'm very careful because like now, you know, you can get your license snatched. I'll tell you guys a story about presentation. Um, I was on the admissions committee at one of the top PA schools in the country. Um, I was very honored that they asked me to come select what students they wanted. All of these young people show up, pinstripe suits. Check my, I got a video um, about how to dress on your interview day. Dress like you're going to a funeral. <laughs> pinstripe suits, the ladies with buns, the guys with the head beards, you know, just very, everybody was very neat looking. I was like, wow, impressive looking group. And we had to, those of us that were interviewing, we'd get a room assignment and then go to the room and you would meet your student that you would, you would interview. I get to the room, this young lady, I see somebody with their head like down on the table, their hair all out. And I, how can I say, hello? Said, oh yeah. Hey, hi. Oh, she stretches and I said, um, are you Miss So-and-so? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're supposed to interview me. Oh, gosh. Yeah? She has a super tight red turtleneck sweater, a pair of faded jeans, and a scarf. And I was like, um, you're sure? You're, the, you're getting interviewed for the piece? Yeah. Hey, look, she get this. She stops me before I start. Before I sit down, yeah, how long is this going to take? Because I got something to do. Oh, gosh. I was like, are you kidding? I said, well, not long. <laughs> <laughs> so, we so can end it right I now, as a matter of fact. Yeah, we're like, take stuff. <laughs> but I just, I just interviewed her, and I went back, and, I, and we talk about you guys. For those of you guys that are fortunate enough to get interviews for med school and PA school. And I said, did you interview so-and-so? She said, yeah, she was horrible. I said, what is up with it wasn't, now, I can understand you can't afford clothes. Listen, I've gone to thrift stores, and I've done videos at thrift stores where I've gotten nice clothes for $10. And I've shown you guys. You can do that. So I said, it was just her attitude. And I think, and I don't want to castigate all millennials. What is it? What's a millennial? Under 30 or something? I actually can't even keep track. Cause now they, what's the yeah. other younger thing they have now? I don't even know. Generation Y or something. Yeah. Like, if you're younger than like us, kids. this is you. We're talking to you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So it's like, dude, yeah, whatever, boomer. Yeah, uh, everything's good. YOLO, you only live once. <laughs> yeah. You you can't be like everybody else, guys. I mean, this is because ultimately you're gonna be the one to save life. You gave you gave a, a really good video, I remember when I first started listening to you about being a superhero. Like I think you were working with a resident and he came in, he's like, Okay, listen to that. Okay, listen to this. Okay. Everybody's freaking out. The resident comes in, he flips some switch and hits some buttons. It's like, boom, we were out. Yeah. That's, you know, that's, and that's one of the reasons why we wanted to become a healthcare practitioner because it's like being a superhero. Yeah. You get to save people's lives, man, or make a profound difference in their life. That requires maturity. Yeah. That requires keeping a, when everybody else is freaking out, you got to be the one that's like, and especially if you're a mid-level or advanced level clinician, whatever we're PAs and MPs we call ourselves and you docs, um, you've got, to, you set the tone. They're going to, people have looked at me, you know, when everybody else is, ah, they kind of look over like, oh, my, oh my. and I say, all right, listen, everybody, this is what's going on. We had a, we had a coronavirus scare. I can talk about this. Now. Oh yeah, let's talk about coronavirus too. Oh well, yeah. yeah, talk about your scare. Yeah, let's yeah. talk about. Let's educate some people on some coronavirus. So people yeah. can stop being yeah. crazy. Costco yeah. sold out of everything. Go ahead. Oh my god. Yeah. So people were freaking out. And they were guys. Like, oh. Said, listen, guys, let's calm down. I put the person on the droplet for because you're you're gonna see all of these things like viruses have been around for long before we even existed. We all have viruses, rhinovirus, influenza virus, coronavirus has been around forever. There's certain, the strand, it's just like the, the influenza virus when the swine flu, there's been three confirmed deaths by the swine flu. Ah, people are freaking out. 
coronavirus, same thing. You know, I, I feel, and this is my opinion, it does not, uh, what's my, my, uh, my, um, <laughs> legal disclaimer? Got, yeah, but, uh, <laughs> disclaimer. It does not necessarily uh, <laughs> coincide or confirm the, uh, that of my employer, or the hospital, or my profession. <laughs> I believe that this is going to blow over like the swine flu, the avian flu, the SARS, the hunter virus, Ebola. When have you heard about Ebola? <laughs> Everybody's um, dying of Ebola. You don't know? Yeah. Everybody. There was a death last year. Yeah. Everybody's dying. But I can tell you this. I also have a background in infectious disease. Um, and I did my doctoral degree on health education and how, you know, health education plays a part as a function of media influence so this word coronavirus i wish the media would be more responsible and talk about the particular strand that is killing people and that strand is killing certain segments of the population so if the person has it if they're immunocompromised meaning if they're significantly older like elderly late 70s and beyond people with congestive heart failure, people who already have upper respiratory, like respiratory tract infections already. Uh, there's a lot of that going around. People who've got um, AIDS. We don't, I haven't seen a lot of AIDS patients, meaning their CD4 count or their T cell counts are, are far below zero or far below uh, 200. But you've got a lot of people who, who um, they, they just don't take their HIV medication. Um, and I did that for a, uh, I worked with these folks for 15 years. Um, when you start seeing people with wasting syndrome, but they're not skinny like me. They're, they've got wasting, loss of subcutaneous yeah. body fat, esophageal candidiasis. These are people with AIDS. These people are prone to dying from the COVID-19. So that the strain that is that is killing people. Um, and and I want I want to be responsible in what I say. But people are buying masks. So a Viron, that's that's a single virus, virus cell. They're tiny. They go through the pores of these masks that people are buying for hundreds of dollars and stealing it off of shelves. You know, um, you know, we we we've had a tuberculosis scare before. You know, and people are like, oh, I got tuberculosis. You know. The viruses are all over the place, but for those of us, and this is this talks again about the maturity of the the maturity, the leadership, the leadership characteristics by way of being unflappable and a stoic on the part of the healthcare community. Um, Anthony Fauci, um, who is uh, he was one of the heads at this at the uh, CDC. Long guy's been an infectious disease specialist for, for decades now. Um, they do a really good job of getting good information out there, but a lot of people just don't read it. Yeah. The media, the news outlet's job is to drive viewership to their their channels. What's the scariest so, stat from right, this right, paper? From this thirty-page paper. What's yeah, the scariest one-liner? Yeah, you'll, you'll have some guy with beautiful hair, like what you can do the death of coronavirus. <laughs> You know, there's been 10 reported deaths of coronavirus. Yeah. I'm here. Okay. <laughs> People Everybody. are dropping like flies. <laughs> yeah. Someone it, thought, it, actually, let me just, yeah. someone actually sent me a text like, hey, are you okay? I'm like, okay, why? Yeah. Oh, they, they quarantined San Diego. I'm like, they quarantined yeah. San They They said on the news. I had to like watch. Like, yeah, there's quarantine camps everywhere. I've yet to see a quarantine camp, guys. <laughs> I work in a hospital. I've right. yet to see a quarantine camp. We've had a couple cases. It's fine. Like, yeah. But anyway, so the media is crazy. Yeah, yeah, but it, it's it it really it makes me angry because I've seen it, just the word coronavirus, everywhere, and people are this people are actually turning on each other. Like, ah, don't come near me. What are you doing? Ah, yeah. Really? Come on. Yeah. Um, one news reporter, one news outlet got it right. Yeah, I was so proud. It was a young guy. I, I, I hadn't seen him on the news before. Not that I watch a lot of television. He says, listen, I don't have a mask on. You know, if you're going to wear a mask, wear it because you're sick and you want to protect other people. Now, they do this in Japan. 
it's considered polite. I, I love Japanese etiquette. It's considered polite to wear a mask if you're in a public setting, especially a closed uh, enclosed public, like a metro or something, because you don't want to give anybody else your your cold, your, your rhinovirus. But um, you know th that's that again. Leadership as as part of being a, a healthcare practitioner, you know, with um, the and I, I guarantee you, in another couple of years, there's going to be something else, some other virus or something exactly. else. People are going to have forgotten about the coronavirus. Just wash your hands. Yeah. You know. MRSA was going to wipe us all out. I don't know if you guys remember yeah. this couple, a couple years ago. Yeah. MRSA was going to literally wipe us all out. That's we right. have nothing to stop the MRSA. Yeah, Everyone's at risk. Yeah, and the flesh-eating bacteria, <laughs> exactly. you know. Yeah, and I, I've had patients with the flesh-eating bacteria, you know, but, but yeah. it, it's you treat it, yeah. you know, to breed the person and stuff. But, um, Perspective of everything, guys. Yeah, yeah. So... Yeah. We are at an hour and 40 minutes, really? guys. Wow, man. Time Holy flies. smokes, guys. Yeah. Impromptu live yeah. interview, hour and 40 minutes. Yeah. Incredible. I like. I learned a lot today. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful gems. Um, if you guys have been enjoying this so far, please, please, please show your love. Comment in the box. Like the video. If you guys like and want to see more of this, you want me, this is my first ever interview. Yeah. My first ever publicly released interview. I, never... My first ever live interview. <laughs> Let's put it yeah. in like it, this is this is nuts, but I kind of like it. It's kind of fun. Yeah, 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 I, I, yeah. I get to sit but, here and learn, right? Like, I, I've always wanted to meet you. I mean, since I, I saw you. <laughs> yeah. So you, you know what been, I did? Yeah. I, I I typed in. Um, no offense to World Star Hip Hop, but <laughs> I, I I I typed in. My God! All right, smart black guys on YouTube. <laughs> I got. I'm serious. I got Dr. Neil through the cross Tyson, um, and then you, and um, uh, Dr. Andre it's good, Webb. It's good, it's good <laughs> yeah. coming to be in there. <laughs> yeah, Google, yeah. Google yeah. really thinks highly of me there. <laughs> no, but I, I was like, yeah, like, um, oh, what's the guy's name? Uh, Dr. Tweedy, uh, oh, white yeah, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so I was yeah. like, and like I said, when I I went to conferences, I I wouldn't see any brothers. that would be like one or two. And we look at each other from across the... I the, see you. Do you see me? Yeah. Like, <laughs> we yeah, give each other the uh, nod. I was about to say, the nod. My wife didn't understand what that was when we first got together. If you guys don't know, my, my wife is white, so she doesn't know about the black person nod. People who are not black, you don't know. It's a thing. I don't even think about yeah, yeah. it. I didn't even realize I was doing it until she pointed out. I'm like, yeah, it's the nod. I got to recognize. Like, you know, we acknowledge each other. And it's yeah. hilarious. It's come full yeah. circle now, right? As an old yeah. person, now I have kids. And so my son... Um, I've taught him that we're black people, right? And so he's like, yeah, black people. Like He's like, he identifies. And so now he actually has incorporated, like he sees black people, and he's not a nodder yet. He's young. He's four. But he's like, throws it up, lets him know, hey, I see you, my black people. We are together here in this place. My wife's like, why are you waving at that person? Like, Just acknowledging them, letting them know we see each other. So uh, I think this was awesome just to be able to put two people of color, two doctors of color on the screen um, for you guys, and I, like I said, I, we got to have you back. We're going to do a whole session. We got to do more sessions, not even one session. Yeah. We're going to do like yeah, a billion sessions because this was just yeah. awesome talking about everything. Yeah. Um, I'm going to make sure I put um, Dr. Omar uh, Abdul Malik's information in the box for you guys to have. Um, so you guys can make sure you guys go follow, you guys go subscribe, you guys can check out uh, his information. But this was fun today. I think all oh, you yeah. guys hung out with us for an hour and 43 minutes. Again, I always do everything atypical. I know interviews are supposed to be like 15 minutes, but why 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 have a little when you can have a lot so yeah. <laughs> it's all good information so again i thank you so much for being here yeah. it means a lot oh, to me I, you I, I not, not them part. you yeah. um yeah. is there yeah. anything you want to say before we get out of here yeah because uh, i don't want to get in trouble at my job yeah the person was did not have the COVID 19. <laughs> no because it was in the news it was in the news and yes. i was like yeah but again i hope you guys enjoyed this for those of you guys that are um applying to school um, it, do this. This may help you if you're trying to decide what's best for you. MD, uh, DO, PA, NP. Make out like a, a kind of a, a, a column. See how long it'll take you to accomplish each. Time will pass anyway. There was a time in my life where I thought 30 was old. Yeah. Now I meet 30-year-old people. I'm like, oh, my God, I could... And they talk to me. I tell them how old I am. They're like, 
oh my god this young lady says you're older than my mom <laughs> it's like oh <laughs> wow <laughs> thank you like, oh. that feels so good thank you for saying that to me my heart doesn't hurt at all by you saying that <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy to still be around but know that the time's gonna pass anyway but just really ask yourself what is the most important things in your life um your core values should not change like your values of loyalty um love fealty for your friendship things like that those are core values, this kind of Covey-esque paradigm. Um, your priorities will change. Money, $100,000 years ago, to me, that was all the money in the world. Now it ain't so much. <laughs> you know? um, it um, means nothing to me with all my loans. $100,000 <laughs> means nothing to me. I need to really fundraise. My GoFundMe would be for like a million and a half to get rid of these school loans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, but that's the thing, and, and understand that that there's there's dynamics, there's going to be shifts in society that will change, and that that may you don't want that to change your core values, but it may change your your priorities and 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 options that you may have. Like fifty years ago, there was no such thing as a little one physician assistants weren't around. Okay. Um, there's new things like robotics in medicine. There's stem cell uh, in medicine. You know, the stuff that I'm sure you learned when you first started out is probably antiquated no. now. You know, so those things are going to change. But I, I, I don't want to. I don't want to talk um, a lot longer. I'm long-winded. But um, <laughs> just, uh, yeah, but what? <laughs> what? Am I looking in the mirror? I am like. You guys yeah. know I can't do a stream under 20 minutes. I try. I'm like, yeah, guys, we're going to do three to five minutes today. Yeah. And next thing I know, it's 45 minutes. Yeah. So this is a short session for me. So you are not long-winded at all yeah. com in comparison to what I be. You're like, well, I'm like, how do we even get here? Like, what day is it? Like, what am I even talking about right now? What yeah. topic is this? I don't know where we're at. <laughs> but anyway, but thank you so much for doing this. Thank, thank you guys you. for hanging out with us and watching this. Like I said, all of Dr. O uh, Omar Abdul Malik's information will be in the box below for you guys to enjoy. Um, this will go up. Um, I'll cut this up and it'll go over to the podcast as well. Don't forget the Domine uh, pre med show. We are podcast ready now. We are yeah. live on YouTube, but the recordings are going up. Any podcast app you like Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, whatever it's up there. Make sure you guys subscribe and, and make sure you guys literally, this is. If you guys don't understand, we put this together in 20 minutes. Literally, yeah. doing it live. Hey, let's do something. Blah, blah, blah. I couldn't even, I've never even done this technology. I'm glad it worked out. You guys can hear us and everything. But uh, kudos to, to you for being able to answer these questions and, yeah. and, and bring us such uh, great content today and so, yeah. so many um, great learning points. I learned a lot today. I'm like, oh man, I'm going to go and just really rack that up, oh, put that in my brain today. So yeah. um, thank you for bringing that. And as part of what yeah. you said in priorities to close and to bring back your mobile, which I liked, to go from your balance seesaw to the mobile yeah. analogy life will come at you it will run go it will go fast stretches will seem hard but at the end of the day guys remembering who you are what you're about what's important to you will keep you centered will keep you grounded and recognizing that even if you do have to do things that maybe are against your priority so mm -hmm. maybe your priority is family like my priority is my family everything else comes a distant second but with that i have to understand that sometimes my career has to be heavily weighted and I have to sacrifice some of that family time in order to provide for my family to get the family time I eventually want. So recognize that life is a continuum, it's a spectrum, it's all over the place. It's, it's the mobile that you saw earlier with the visual aids, it's a mobile. And understand that there's going to be times where there's tipping points where you feel extremely busy, you feel extremely hurried, you feel extremely out of sync with yourself because you're doing things that aren't necessarily in line with your priorities. But recognize that these are setting you up for your down the road priorities. So as young people, as two old guys talking to you, you young people, I know your journey seems hard. I know what you're going through seems like the worst. I know you have wants and desires and you want them now. Understand, your balance will come, your life will come. Keep that strong in your mind. Keep your center. Keep whatever you believe in and whatever value system you hold dear to you. And you guys have heard me say before, I said I'm a black male physician and I'm a Christian. And as part of that, I say that for me to sum up what my values are is that I want to be a good person. I want to spread love. I want to treat others as I want to be treated. And I just want, I want us all to get along. And so for you guys, recognize what your values are and what's important to you. I want to hang out with my family and I want to be good to people. 
that like that's a winning day for me if I can be good to people, get some hugs somewhere along the line, right? Because hugs always make people's days better. Whatever, recognize what your priorities are, and then work to create that life of those priorities and what you want, and you'll be happy. Because the money will come and go, the yeah. career will come and go. It doesn't matter if you're PA and MD. There's miserable PAs, there's miserable doctors, and there's lots of miserable doctors. It's heavier way than those doctors, <laughs> right? But what will make you happy is if you followed your heart and you followed your goal and you always kept your true center of what matters to you. And as two guys have told you, the most valuable relationship is the relationship you have with your spouse. And pick the right spouse and hold on to that and at all times work to maintain that relationship because just like professional life, personal life is work. Yeah. Like right yeah. now, my wife is angry at me. I'm going to have to do some real work right now in a relationship because I told her I was going to be on here. I'm like, uh, again, right? I'm going to do 20 minute live. It'll be 20 minutes and then I'm going to get off, right? Like, and I've been on here for two hours right now and she's mad because now she has to take the, the kids to the movies by herself. Oh, and no. so I'm, Yeah, it's going to be bad. But again, it's okay because I'll make it up to her. And I make it to her every day being nice to her. But be kind to people. Like, care about people, be a professional, and just, man, be good people. We need better people in this world. So, anyway, thank you so much. All right. Everyone, we are getting out of here. As always, we end. No excuses, just dominate. Thank you guys for joining us. Later. Today is the day, guys. No more excuses. No more complaining. You're going to take your future in your own hands. You're going to dominate. You're going to be successful. Get to my website, studenttransformation.com. I challenge you. What are you going to do today to make your life better?